Oh, oh that's hot. That's hot. During the late 90s, Don Bluth and Gary Goldman rested peacefully at Fox Animation Studios after a long line of commercial and critical failures. However, in my last video reviewing Anastasia, I made a bit of a mistake. Turns out there's actually a third film that Don and Gary worked on at Fox, and it's actually a direct-to-video sequel. That's right, even Don and Gary couldn't help but jump on the direct-to-video bandwagon that was popular during this time. It's so funny how so many of their previous works had direct-to-video sequels, and yet this is the only one they actually got to work on. And it is... um... Starting today, every whisper turns into a shout! <laughs> well... It's not bad. It's weird, but it's not bad. The film is called Bartok the Magnificent, a prequel, actually, about the bad Bartok from Anastasia. And it takes place in the 1570s! Huh, that would mean that Bartok is hundreds of years old. <laughs> I wonder what other places Bartok's been to. Ooh, there he is at the Battle of Thermopylae. Oh, and there he is at the sacking of Rome. Oh, and there he is at Jesus' crucifixion. Point is, this is weird, but we won't find out why until we get into it. So without further ado, this is Bartok the Magnificent. So the movie begins with Bartok as he throws on a show for the local peasants. Turns out before he worked with a dangerous, psychotic wizard from Limbo, Bartok was a con man who fooled people out of their money by lying about his incredible feats, such as lifting heavy weights, fighting dragons, and even a bear who's actually his partner, Zozi. Right away, you'll probably notice that the animation is definitely not on the same level as Anastasia's, which is to be expected, it's a direct-to-video sequel after all. But with that being said, despite some hiccups here and there, the animation actually looks a lot better than your usual direct-to-video feature. The backgrounds are fantastic, the overall look of this film really gives you that classic Dragon's Lair vibe, and plus every character's design is unique and helps all of them stand out in their own unique way. Except for Tsar Ivan, who is literally just Dimitri as a kid. Like I said, smaller budget, what are you gonna do? Speaking of which, you wanna know how I know this film takes place in the 1570s? Well, because that, my friends, is Ivan Romanov. <laughs> Ivan Romanov was the uncle to Tsar Michael I, who was the very first Romanov Tsar during the Romanov rule in Russia. In real life, he was seen as one of Michael's most prestigious advisors, but never truly Tsar, at least according to my research. So, yeah, you thought the last film was being historically inaccurate? Well, you ain't seen nothing yet, Jack. So Ivan loves the show that Bartok threw on and throws him a ring. But his advisor Ludmilla tells him it's a sacred ring and he shouldn't have given it up so well. <laughs> you can't go around giving royal jewels to commoners. <laughs> Don't be that way. The people liked the bat. Did you see how he made them smile? <laughs> it was nice to see them happy. <laughs> oh, Russian Tsar actually caring about the people. <laughs> I told you this movie didn't care about being accurate. Your Highness, are you listening to me? I'm tired of listening to you, Lamilla. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bartok and Zozi are busy counting the money when we learn of Zozi being quite the thespian, which is unsurprising considering his voice by Kelsey Grammer. Well, suffice it to say, the performance of my death today would have shamed Prometheus. I wish you could hear yourself. It's really quite irritating. Critics. Sometimes they want to see you be good at what you do, and other times, they're just dicks. Big, big dicks. Will you give the prince back his ring? Uh, well, what's the hurry? He's not going anywhere. The prince has been kidnapped. <gasps> so Ivan is kidnapped and everyone believes it to be Baba Yaga, a local witch who loves to terrorize people in her spare time. When Ludmilla asks if anyone can help, some kids recommend Bartok, even though he doesn't want to. Oh, please, magnificent Bartok. <laughs> Save my Tsar, please. 
Ah, uh, I'll do it. Ah, uh, nothing like some good old emotional manipulation to get a plot going. Yeah, she must be a member of PETA. So Zozi tries to convince Bartok to actually go and save the prince, and even sings a song to encourage him. Yeah, I forgot to mention, like Anastasia, this movie's a musical too. The songs overall are honestly just okay, in my opinion. Like, it's no surprise that the songs would be on a lower tier than the last movies, but they do sound good, and even the weaker ones are at least short enough to where they don't linger for too long. So Bartok and Zozi head to the Iron Forest, which looks awesome, by the way, and ends up finding Baba Yaga's castle. However, it is guarded by Tim Curry's character from Enchanted Christmas. And don't act like it's not, it so clearly is. So they answer the riddle correctly, and Bartok is allowed to enter. We then see Baba Yaga's home, which lives on giant chicken legs. Why giant chicken legs, may I ask? Well, I'll go more into this later, but it looks cool, okay? So Bartok enters the home, just as Baba Yaga comes home. We then get a song from her that is, um, a bit erotic? Which is life is very solitary. No one around to talk to my trees. What was Baba Yaga planning to do if Bartok didn't show up? Now I'm actually afraid to do more research on her. So Baba Yaga is mad that Bartok just walked in, despite being given the key from Tim Curry, and tells him he must go on three missions in order to save Tsar Ivan. This is actually based on the actual folklore that is a Baba Yaga. Baba Yaga in Slavic lore is a supernatural being, or sometimes three sisters all with the same name, who often appear as a deformed or old woman. There are many different interpretations of her throughout time, such as them depicting her as an evil, child-eating witch, while others depict her as simply misunderstood and wanting to be left alone. Sometimes she'll help the main protagonist, other times she'll end up being the villain. In the lore, her home walked on two giant chicken legs, and in one of the folk tales, the hero was sent by Baba Yaga to do three things to accomplish his goal. Now, what was the goal, you may ask? Well, honestly, I'm not sure. I've looked head over heels on the internet for any information on this particular story, but I couldn't find anything that gave me a definitive answer. The story itself is called The Maiden Czar, so I believe that the goal is that of Mario's, basically where he had to save a princess, but like I said, I have no real idea. But regardless of the end goal, whatever it is, the story is actually pretty similar to that of the films. Now, Bartok must go on three missions to save a czar, just like the main hero in the book. I gotta say, it's pretty cool that they actually used a real Russian story to try and enhance this story. It stays in line with the original film, and even if the story still does whatever it wants from here on out, it is pretty neat that Don and his team did all that research. So Bartok's first mission is to find a creature known as Pilaf, which is- WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT THING?! No, really, what the fuck is that?! Is she a dog, a worm, a snake, a caterpillar, a cat? They're probably wondering where I'm getting all these guesses. Well, I wanna know what your guesses are! So it turns out Pilaf is stuck in- well, they call it a bowler, but it's clearly a piece of machinery. So Bartok has to use his brains to get her out. He even uses his karate chop, which was a brief joke in the first movie, or last, or whatever. I kind of like how he wasn't just joking. He really does have a good karate chop. Makes you wonder what would happen if Rasputin had sent Bartok after Anastasia. Not that he would. So Bartok is able to get Pilaf back, but now Bartok must collect a helmet from a troll named Obel. They go to his lair and decide to just ask for it. Because I'm sure that'll work. Fun fact, it doesn't. You stupid! So, using his corny tricks, Bartok manages to get the helmet and takes it back to Baba Yaga. Finally, he must collect a magic feather that hangs in the sky, but he can't fly to grab it. And somehow just got the boulder there. Somehow. Yeah, I know the movie's hinting that he uses those ropes from before, but come on, cartoon logic can only go so far, you guys. Speaking of which, I think now might be a good time to talk about the film's pacing. Now, obviously being a direct-to-video sequel, the budget's gonna be smaller, and I get that. But doesn't the pacing of the film feel really just... off to anyone else? The movie is only 65 minutes long, the shortest of any Don Blue film if you don't count as short films, and it feels like it. The movie has these moments that really feels like stuff was cut out, which, as far as I know, didn't happen like with Don's previous works. With movies like The Land for Time and All Dogs Go to Heaven, those movies were heavily altered by the studios and footage had to be cut out of them. But the editing in them was still so good that you hardly really noticed, if at all. But in this one, it definitely feels like stuff got cut out, as the pacing tends to just rush through certain bits, leaving things a bit too open to interpretation, or simply relying on exposition to bridge the gap. He's actually rather charming for an oversized skull, once you get past his inquisitive nature. Yeah, we never saw that. 
As a result, while I know this is a smaller film, it still makes the journey feel rather smaller than I think they intended. Bartok's supposed to be going to these far-off places, but the way the film is cut, it makes it feel like these far-off places are just right next door, diminishing the scale of the journey. Gosh, I feel like we've been walking for hours here. We have. And again, I know this is a smaller story, but it's still trying to convey some scale, but it just fails in my opinion when it tries. Maybe if this film was given just five more minutes of footage, it really could have helped out a lot in certain places. So Bartok is able to get the feather by destroying the machinery, again proving it wasn't a boulder, and rearranging it into a tower. He brings it to Baba Yaga, but discovers he has to give her something of his, which wasn't part of the agreement. Okay, okay, here it is, the mother load, an autographed portrait of Ivan the Terrible. I, uh, I caught him in a good mood. No. <laughs> I guess history jokes are just like my biggest weakness. Like, I don't know. Oh, I'm such a nerd. So Bartok loses his temper and insults Baba Yaga, making her break down in tears. I didn't mean what I said. Look, nobody hates you, okay? I wish I could give you what you need. <sighs> you just did the most important ingredient from your heart. Emotional manipulation, ha ha ha. It's Peter's greatest weapon. So Baba Yaga tells Bartok where Ivan is and it's revealed that she never even took him. Ah, uh, you never took him, did you? I never said I did. Well, how else were you supposed to learn the lesson? By having me just say it to you? That wouldn't make for a good story now, would it? So Baba Yaga gives Bartok a potion that will make him stronger than he is now and he travels to Moscow where he can tell Ludmilla about what he's learned. Which begs the question, how did Baba Yaga learn about him in the first place? You sure she had nothing to do with it? What if something goes wrong? We still don't know who took the prince. Yeah, but what is this? Cabbage. You stupid! <laughs> really? You think it's a smart idea to be in a cabbage cart in a heavily populated city where you know for a fact that shit's about to go down? Yeah, this is an Avatar joke. Yeah, you, you see it coming already. I, I'm, I'm done trying. So it turns out, to no one's actual shock, that Ludmilla was actually the one who kidnapped the Tsar, hoping to usurp his power. She locks up Bartok and takes his potion. Oh, hello, my inhibition's molting. More than just the peasants are revolting. Starting today is the grand transformation. Now I know some of y'all have a fetish for this. Don't bother denying it. So after drinking the potion, Ludmilla turns into Spyro the Dragon if he was an old, wrinkly Karen. So Zozi is able to break everyone out of their cells before they drown, and Bartok goes on to stop Ludmilla. Not so fast! Ah! Ah! You stupid! Have a nice trip! See you next fall! So using the various skills he learned on his quest, Bartok is able to defeat Ludmilla and save all of Moscow. All 12 people in it. Yeah, like I said before, smaller budget, you can see for yourselves. It was those tasks that helped you become what you always wanted to be. And I never gave her anything. What do you mean? You gave her what she needed most. Your compassion, Bartok. You gave her your compassion. Yeah, after making her upset in the first place. And then she later admitted she didn't care. Kind of muddles that a bit, don't you think? I get the message you're going for, but being emotionally manipulated into being compassionate isn't exactly a good thing either. Basically, just be nice to the people who use you and then gaslight you into thinking that you're the dick. Yeah, that's a great life lesson there, Zozie. Well, when you got it, you got it, I guess, Zozie. I tell you what, I'm one heck of a guy. You certainly are. That's why in about 300 years I'm going to help a crazy wizard destroy the entire Russian Empire and try to murder an innocent girl. Like I said, I'm one heck of a guy. Just don't tell Ivan that it's a descendant of his, okay? By the way, where will I be in the next movie? Probably dead, Zozi. No one cared enough about this movie to ask that question. So that was Bartok the Magnificent. And, like I said, it's weird. Fun, but weird. There is a weird charm to this film that, while it's no classic by any means, you can tell the people behind the film chose to simply just have fun with the story. Simply put, have Bartok go from place to place, get into silly shenanigans and battles, and learn some lesson the kids will like well enough. 
even if it is oddly executed. I definitely think this one is aimed more for little kids as opposed to stuff like Lamb for Time, but as kids flicks go, it's perfectly fine. Animation's still very impressive for the budget they've got, the side characters are likable enough, music's fine, story's fine, it's all pretty fine overall. So, if you're interested in checking it out, then I see no harm. See for yourself and watch the magic unfold. So now that that's over, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to take a bit of a break from the Don Blue stuff since it's the holidays now and I need to focus on those. So, Chewy, what are we doing for Halloween? What? Are you serious? There's another Bigfoot film? You gotta be kidding me. Another sequel to Son of Big. Tell me, creature, what's your diet? My diet? What kind of question is that? If it moves, I eat it. I'm just going to draw a small amount of blood from you. Blood? You in what army? You try to prick me, I'll rip that human off with your head still in it, cocksucker. This is gonna be a really weird Halloween, isn't it? And my fallen hearts will let go. The memories keep me together. Gotta fight till the end, no crying.